Here we go. Hello. So, welcome everyone. I'm Paul Sievers, Associate Professor of Literary Studies at Bucknell and Deacon at St. John's Russian Orthodox Church in Lewisburg. It's, it's my privilege to welcome Professor Jordan Peterson of the University of Toronto to Bucknell and Lewisburg. I do so on behalf of the Bucknell Program for American Leadership, a faculty think tank which I direct, and also of the Open Discourse Coalition of Bucknell Alumni and Friends, a Lewisburg-based educational foundation that made tonight's event possible. Thank you, generous donors. Pro yes. Pro Professor Peterson has been called the most prominent public intellectual in the world today. His books have sold millions of copies, and we are pleased to host him in his first public appearance in more than two and a half years. Professor Peterson's academic work on personality assessment has earned him scholarly respect. His public work engages perennial aspects of what makes us human and how to flourish as human beings, as witnessed by many traditions and cultures in the face of challenges of growing up in the 21st century. His topic tonight is free speech as a precondition for mental and social health. The relationship between free speech and health at both individual and social levels is highlighted in much of Professor Peterson's work, including his exploration of the psychology of totalitarianism. In his foreword to the 50th anniversary edition of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, Professor Peterson referenced the tens of millions who died under communism in the past century in severe deprivation of free expression. He eloquently concluded, may God himself eternally fail to forgive us if in the painstakingly revealed aftermath of such bloodshed, torture and anguish, we remain stiff-necked, incautious, and unchanged. Solzhenitsyn warned that it can happen here in the West, and we should be wise in discerning the cultural climate on the horizon. Students at Bucknell tell me of the stress they experience when they feel unable to speak freely and feel forced to perform like actors in agreeing with slogans and advocacies of professors indoctrinating them in certain ideologies. Faculty find themselves unfairly targeted by ostracism and hostility because of non-conforming cultural identities and views. Something deeply unhealthy stirs in our intellectual life nationwide. Today, as always, standing up for free expression as fundamental to human life comes at a cost demanding sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice on behalf of free expression as a human need can be glimpsed nearby us tonight. In the Lewisburg Cemetery next to campus lies a young Bucknellian who took seriously the signs of his times. George H. Raymer, class of 1950. After service in World War II fighting Nazism, George graduated from Bucknell and went to work teaching civics at Lewisburg High School. When the Korean War began, he re-enlisted to fight the spread of communism. Wounded in combat, refusing aid for himself, he fought single-handedly to his death to cover the withdrawal of injured fellow soldiers receiving the Medal of Honor. Thankfully, we are not in direct physical warfare for the cause of free expression on American college campuses today, but we face increasingly high stakes intellectual and social challenges in American intellectual life, which arguably threaten mental and ultimately physical health, both as individuals and as a nation. George Raymer's courage uplifts us, so too in psychology and media do Professor Peterson's insights on this topic today help inspire us with courage. Now I turn to Isabella Correga, Bucknell class of 2022, an honored student advocate of free speech on this campus, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Professor Sievers. Before I begin my introduction, I would like to remind the audience of the Weiss Center policy on tonight's event. Please turn off all electronics for the duration of the evening. Filming is strictly prohibited, and there will be additional time at the conclusion of the lecture for Q&A. They say all roads lead to Rome, but in this age of technology, I think we can agree that all late night YouTube video binges lead to a recommended Jordan Peterson lecture video. 
My first encounter with Dr. Peterson's work was my sophomore year of high school in 2016, when I stumbled upon an interview in which he gave various opinions on religion, myth, science, and truth. It evoked for me important aspects of the mystery of life and of human nature, the need for both self-discipline and creativity. Little did I know that only a few years later, I would be standing in front of a large audience at a major university, introducing him in person. There is no denying the profound impact of Dr. Peterson's principles and wisdom, which he so generously shares with the world. Dr. Peterson says in his book, 12 Rules for Life, that when you have something to say, silence is a lie. That rule has informed my academic work as a student, as president of Bucknell Conservatives Club, as an elected official in my native New Jersey, and as a student affiliate with the Bucknell Program for American Leadership and the Open Discourse Coalition. The liberal arts tradition, at its finest, is about thoughtful dialogue and problem solving. Involving diversity of cultural and philosophical viewpoints is essential to that process. The Open Discourse Coalition, founded just one year ago, does just that, facilitating the liberal arts tradition of Bucknell and ensuring that intellectual diversity is upheld. Some months ago, the Open Discourse Coalition asked students on campus who they wanted to hear from during this academic year. Jordan Peterson was by far the overwhelming choice. I should note, as Professor Sievers mentioned earlier, that this is Dr. Peterson's first public appearance in more than two and a half years. For that, we are both honored and elated to have been his first choice as well. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jordan Peterson to Bucknell. speech as a precondition for mental and social health. What does free mean? Freud discovered that if you brought people who were suffering into a clinical setting and you let them and you prepared a space for them where they could say anything they felt like saying that a psychological transformation would occur that their thought would wander of its own accord in some sense precisely to those areas that were most deeply disturbing and unsettling to them. And that as a consequence of that wandering, they would attain a certain clarity and psychological stability that was not evident before that. Now Freud has become quite the whipping boy in recent years, and I think that's the fate of geniuses whose revelations are so profound that a hundred years we take them for granted as second nature and only see the errors that, that are left behind. Carl Rogers, who was arguably, he was one of the greatest clinical psychologists of the last half of the 20th century said something that was an elaboration of the Freudian notion in some sense. Of course, and Rogers had been informed by what Freud had discovered and what other people had developed in, in the line of clinical treatment, psychiatric treatment. Rogers, who was uh, raised as a Protestant and who wanted to be an evangelist when he was a teenager and went to university, but partly because of the scientific training that he had also obtained from his father, who had applied scientific management techniques to his farm, 
fell prey to the conflict between scientific and religious thinking and became agnostic or at least atheistic, but maintained his central faith in the redeeming quality of the untrammeled word. He believed and put forth as an element of psychological doctrine that the primary goal of the therapist who was attempting to foster the mental health and let's say the cessation of the suffering, unnecessary suffering of his clients was required above all to listen. Now, listening, that's a hard thing. Why? Because sometimes you hear things you don't want to hear. And you can't make light of that. And you can't say, well, you should just put up with it because we don't know exactly how to put up with it because sometimes you really hear things that you don't want to hear and you're hurt because of it. And that hurt can be deep. And so it's hard to listen. And so Roger said, you think you listen, but you don't. Here's a little experiment, he said. The next time that you're engaged in a dispute with someone, and so let's say this is someone in your family, and you're having a hard time reaching an accord, and so you're suffering the conflict that lack of peace necessarily produces, and they see things differently than you do, and they're trying to make a case for their perspective, which might involve the revelation of something that undermines one of your cherished beliefs or even an accusation about your misbehavior. Will you listen? Well, why wouldn't you? Well, you don't want to be wrong. You don't want to be to blame. You want to convince yourself that what you already know is enough. You want to convince yourself that you're good in your current state. And you certainly don't want to allow yourself to be deeply disturbed by the revelation of an unpleasant truth that you cannot deny. And so you're motivated not to listen. And how might you not listen? Well, you can indicate your anger, you can indicate your displeasure, you can do that without using words, you can glare, you can roll your eyes. That's a good way to get divorced, by the way. <laughs> I'm dead serious. The best predictor of divorce, if you're a couples counselor, is eye rolling. And that's disgust. And once the relationship has degenerated because of lack of communication, perhaps, malevolence, perhaps, ignorance, and there's nothing left but disgust. There's nothing left of the relationship. How do you know if you were listening? Well, Roger said, here's a way you can check yourself. And, and this is unbelievably useful. You can actually do this. And if you do it, it will change your life. If you do it, if you do it seriously, if you make it a practice, right? if you make it part of you, it will change your life completely. When someone talks to you, you have to restate back what they said in terms they agree with. And that means you don't play any tricks, right? You can't twist their words. You can't defend yourself with all the little tricks you've learned to defend yourself, all the deceptive tricks that protect what you already know. You have to adopt their point of view. You have to do it with sincerity, and you have to reflect it back to them. And they have to agree. Now, Roger said, if you do that, most of the emotion will go out of the discussion. That's not necessarily true. But it's often true, because a lot of conflict is simply a matter of misunderstanding, sometimes just terminological under misunderstanding. That's certainly true in philosophical discourse. But it's also very frequently true in, in ordinary discourse. And so, you can at least be sure that if you can restate back to the person what they said, 
they know you were listening. Well, what does that mean, that they know that you were listening? It means that you acted out the proposition that they had something worth attending to, right? Well, what's attention? Well, that's, that's what everybody fights for. That's value itself. That's what advertisers pay millions of dollars for, attention. And so if you're attending to someone, well, there's no higher compliment that you can possibly pay to them. And so if you want to indicate to someone with whom you have a conflict that you value them, then you pay attention, despite what it might do to you. I was a clinician, in some sense, you play out the role of the parent that wasn't there. Now, not always, but often. And so why is it so important to play out that role? What is it that a parent does? Well, a parent loves, right? And, and that means accepts in some fundamental way. You can really see that in the maternal relationship with an infant, right? Because there's, there's an almost infinite acceptance there when that's done right. And that's a wonderful thing, and it's definitely part of love, but it's not all of it by any stretch of the imagination, because encouragement is also part of love. And to love someone for whom they, who they are is a maternal embrace of sorts, and to love them for who they could be is encouragement. And both of those together make up the highest kind of love, to say, you can always come back here, but we really hope you can become who you are. And you know, you know this is true, that underneath, under the attentive eye of a gaze that unites those two desires, the child flourishes. You know, if you have a friend like that, the same thing happens. Right? They like you. They'd also like you to be more. And when you are more, then they attend to that. And this is another thing you can do that will change your life. And you watch the people around you. Attend to them. Whenever they do something you'd like them to do more of, you reward them. And that's hard, eh? Because sometimes a friend or family member if they're moving in a direction that elevates themselves and you're not, then their movement towards that higher form of being is a judgment on your insufficiency and a temptation to use punishment when you see the manifestation of something better. And if you don't think you do that, you're either a saint or a liar. And there aren't that many saints. free I have this acquaintance I've made recently he's one of Canada's great journalists he's a real poet a real admirer of poetry master of words a deep man very honest very charismatic he's, he, he's certainly Canada's greatest journalist he said something to me when we met last. He said, all art aspires to the condition of music. And I thought that was so great. I think all speech aspires to the condition of music, and speech has a musical element. It carries a lot of the emotion, the musical element of speech. And in fact, music is a derivation of the musical element of speech, and it has an emotional impact on us because it, it presents that to us in a purified form, in some sense. Imagine a neophyte pianist sitting at the piano, attempting to master a difficult musical phrase, note by note, phrase by phrase. And the music's a hierarchy, right? Because 
there's each individual note, but then there's the relationship of the notes to each other at every level of analysis all the way up to the totality of the piece, right? The totality of a symphony informs every note. The totality of a symphony informs every phrase. Every phrase informs every note. So you can move up and down the levels of analysis in music, and if, if you love to listen to music, you do that while you listen, especially if the music is well arranged, because you can listen to one instrument carrying the melody line, and then you can switch to the drums, and you can listen to the vocals, you can move back and forth, up and down in the hierarchical structure of the music. That's what consciousness does. Now you sit down and you try to work out a piece on the piano. What are you doing exactly? You're automatizing musculature. It's hard. You're programming your body, right? You're doing that with conscious awareness. You painstakingly move through the notes. This is especially true if you're a neophyte. Some people are so brilliant at playing the piano, they can sight read instantly and do a perfect job of it, but we're not going to talk about those people at the moment. Mere mortals, note by note, right? And you listen and you get faster at it and faster at it. It gets more unconscious in some sense because you can do that automatically. But then you move up a level of analysis and you see if the automatic note by note mastery that you've attained is now appropriate at the level of phrase. And then if you get really good at it, if you get genius level at it, you can take those phrases that you've automatized and you can see them in relationship to the entirety of the symphony and you can twist and bend them just a tiny bit to put little mistakes on the edges of notes. So you really see that with acoustic instruments. And then you go even beyond perfection as a musician to the use of imperfection creatively. And when that happens, it's sacred. And that's why we love it. Because the sacred nourishes us. And this is the truth. It's a definition. And just because we don't know what the sacred is doesn't mean that isn't true. And that's the humanities, right? That's the attempt to discover what's sacred and to understand it. When you're playing a piece, you make a mistake. And then you go back and you, you concentrate on the phrase that you played an error. And you, you may have automatized that mistake, which means your faulty knowledge now interferes with your ability to learn how to play it properly. And so not only do you have to focus on the mistake with your conscious awareness, you have to undo the certainty that gave rise to that error. You have to unpack the automatization. You have to re-automatize it, then you have to integrate it back into the piece. Okay. That's exactly what you do in life. That's exactly what you do with speech. Free speech. That's no right. Or maybe it is, but we could talk about what a right is. Well, you could say, well, there's rights. There's a list of them. There's something granted to you by the government. They're granted to you by the social contract. That's one way of looking at it. It's true in some sense, because the domain of rights is governed in some sense by consensus. There's a social contract element to it, but that doesn't mean that's all there is to it. It certainly doesn't mean that rights are only what the government allows you or that society allows you. It certainly does not mean that. And it, and it does not mean that for a reason. It's a reason that's outside of propositional argument. And we have an intuition of that, well delineated in the West with the notion of natural right, which is a metaphysical notion. Right? And, and it, isn't, it isn't pointing to a reality that we can understand in an obvious manner. It's certainly not pointing to a reality we can understand in the same remarkably propositionalized manner that we've been able to understand an assortment of scientific truths. But that doesn't mean that it isn't pointing to something real. It just means, it may mean that it's pointing to something that's real but so complicated we haven't been able to work it out yet. Well, that's what we're doing in the humanities. We're trying to work that out. Free speech. My son comes to me and has a problem. Maybe he has a problem with me. But what do I do if I love him? I listen. Why? Why listen? Well, he isn't going to know what to think if I don't listen. Neither am I. 
free speech. What's speech exactly? What is speech? What is that? How about this? It's the most social form of thought. Now, there's other social forms of thought. Artists produce images, and they can be great. They can be unbelievably profound. They can produce images that are so complex that it takes thousands of years to understand what they represent. But they're not delineated and propositionalized the same way that speech is. And they're more difficult to put into practice images. It's like trying to interpret a dream. It's like the dream can be unbelievably wise. The dreams of our civilizations are unbelievably wise. But that doesn't mean we can delineate them and propositionalize them. They're beyond us in some real sense. So image can be a form of social thought, but it's not. It has advantages and disadvantages that speech doesn't have. Speech. A lot of the time when we're thinking, we think in words. So speech is, speech is tightly related to thought because we think with speech. And that's quite interesting because we didn't invent those words, right? They're not our own creations. And that's something to think about with regards to words. They're not our own creations. And we don't know how they come about. And just because you want someone to say some words, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should. You think in words. And words, they're part of the social consensus. And they emerge and they manifest themselves and they work in ways that we don't understand. And that consensus is established by mechanisms that we don't understand. Sometimes a word will just catch on, right? It pops out of nowhere and then it's everywhere and everyone's using it. But we don't know why. It's the word has articulated something that's in the air that hasn't been articulated before that everyone feels but no one knows how to say. It's just what comedians do too, by the way. And that's why we love them and why they're so necessary. The greatest comedians, you know what everyone's thinking. Oh God, I thought that, but I wouldn't dare to say it. Oh God, I thought that, but I, I didn't know how to say it. Or you said it's in such a witty manner that just be, even though it's true, I can tolerate it. That's a comedian. And so beware of people who put constraints on comedians because they're tyrants who can't tolerate the fool. And that's how you know they're tyrants. Speech. We can think in images, but mostly we think in language. OK, so is there a difference between speech and thought? How about no? Here's something else. How about most people think by talking? That internalized speech, that, that ability to think propositionally in the purely mental space, in the purely subjective space, that's an unbelievably sophisticated skill. And I don't know if you know this, but until the dawn of the printing press, almost no one could read silently. Almost no one could read, period. But those who did read, read aloud. That internalized ability to read, that's really new. It's very much akin to thinking. And it's by no means obvious at all that people, generally speaking, are as good at thinking as they are at talking. And there's no difference between talking and thinking. So if they can't talk, well, then they can't think. Well, so what, you might say? Why is thinking so important? Well, you tell your children, why don't you think before you act? You know, you're not that supportive of thoughtless, impulsive behavior. Why? Well, let's talk about thought. What's thought? Technically, what is it exactly? Psychologically, spiritually, what is thought? When I move voluntarily, whatever that means, it's not reflexive, right? I seem to have some decision about which movement I'm going to manifest. Not always. I might be reacting to something that frightens me or shying away from pain. Something reflexive. But it seems subjectively that I have this choice. And that's mediated by the motor cortex, by the way. And 
the part of our brain that is responsible for voluntary production of speech is part of the prefrontal cortex, the premotor, it's part, it's out of the motor cortex in the course of evolution grew the premotor cortex. Imagine you imagine moving before you move. Well, then you'd be using the premotor, premotor cortex. You can imagine moving, and then you move. Okay, well, this happens all the time. So maybe you're a guy and you're in a nightclub and you want to go ask a girl if she would like a drink or would like to dance with you, though well, she probably wouldn't. And, and then that's your problem, that's for sure. <laughs> and so you play that out in your imagination, maybe play it out three or four different ways. And why do you do that? Well, because you, you want to rehearse the pattern of action that you're going to implement before you go over there and implement it in action and get rejected. You're trying to imagine some sequences of action and speech that are sufficiently worth implementing that you won't get rejected. And you can do that in imagination. You can just picture yourself moving and then you can act out one of those pictures. With speech, you can represent the pictures that you use to imagine the movement. That's what speech is. It's a further abstraction of hypothetical movement. It's more than that, because it's also a further abstraction of hypothetical perception. You know, because you can say to someone, well, you can see it this way. And you actually mean that, because you can switch the ways that you look at the world so that what you see changes in a profound sense. What you value determines what you see, not completely. It certainly shapes it. First is the action, then there's the representation of the action in imagination. That's a dream. You know, when, when you're dreaming, there's a part of your brain that shuts off, so you're paralyzed. And if you remove that in animals, then the animals just run around when they're dreaming, and that's not a good idea because they're asleep and then they crash into things. And, and, well, that's not so good for them. But at night, you can imagine what could be in a multitude of different ways, without acting it out. Well, why is that useful? So you won't die. That's why. One of the world's greatest philosophers, and I always forget his name, I think it's Alfred North Whitehead, said, we think so that our thoughts can die instead of us. And that's exactly right. It's exactly right. Speaking biologically, so animals have a certain capacity to voluntarily alter their patterns of movement. And if they get it wrong, well, it can be fatal. A cat runs out into the street. That's the end of that. A mistake is fatal. Mistakes could be fatal to us, that's for sure. And if not fatal, they can put us somewhere where that is so bad that fatal would be better. And so we have to be careful with what, how we look at things and what we do. And so how do we become careful about that? Well, what we managed as we emerged biologically was to produce abstract representations of the world and then to act within them. And then we learned how to code that in speech. And so when you tell someone a story, and of course people are completely compelled by stories, you use words to describe images of patterns of action. And why would people find that compelling? Well, it's actually because you're wise enough to have an instinct for imitation. Think about this now for a second. You admire someone. Okay. That's happened to everyone. Now, you might be disabused of that admiration. You may be betrayed, all of that. That's not the point. The point is that's a human experience, and it's a very fundamental human experience. It's one of the most fundamental human experiences. When you're a child, perhaps a boy, you, you feel admiration for your father, or maybe an uncle, maybe an older brother, maybe a, the boy down the street who's a little bit older than you developmentally. You can do a bunch of interesting things that you can just about do, but not quite, and so he's a perfect target for the instinct for imitation that compels you towards higher development. 
the zone of proximal development in the Russian psychologist Vygotsky's term, that compels your interest. What's your interest? It's the attraction to something worth imitating. Why would you imitate? Well, why not steal from the best? Well, how is the best marked? By compelling your interest. Why? Because you have an instinct for development that's deep and profound. And what do we do with our literary constructions? We weave stories to represent those patterns that are most worth imitating. And so we find the hero of a novel compelling. Now, it could be an anti-hero, but it doesn't matter, because all that is, is anti-imitation. <laughs> Don't do that. That's just as salutary, right? This is, you see, the villain in a narrative meet a terrible end. It's like, don't imitate that. You see the heroes thrive and develop even through the vicissitudes of life. It's a definition of a hero. You know, when I used to take my kids to the movies, and we took them to scary movies, to keep an eye on him. Well, things are scary. Keep an eye on him. Right? He'll get through this. And the thing about that that's so remarkable, and this is what's so compelling to children, adults as well, because obviously we will pay to go see movies, which is very strange if you think about it. It's very strange. The more you think about that, the stranger it gets. What's better? To be shielded from the horrors of the world? or to watch someone walk through them. Well, good luck getting rid of the horrors of the world. You protect your children from that. You're the horror of the world. That's the Freudian Oedipal nightmare. Speech is thought. OK, so let's pursue that a bit more. Well, how smart are you? Well, I don't know how smart you are. Maybe you're the smartest person in the room. But you can be bloody well sure that there's a bunch of people in here who know a bunch of things that you could use. Use, let's say. Is your life everything it could be? Or are you suffering a little more than you think might be absolutely necessary? And is it possible that some of that suffering is due to your ignorance and perhaps even to your malevolence? And if that's the case, isn't it possible that someone who knows something you don't might have something to tell you that would ameliorate the suffering? And isn't it obvious that more brains have more thoughts? And isn't it something that we have access to what other people think? Not only now, but in the past as well. So that all of a sudden, the social capacity of speech enables us to think communally. Well, why wouldn't we do that? Well, we do. We're absolutely compelled to do that. We want to know what other people are thinking. We want to know what other people are valuing. Why? Well, if they value it, it might be valuable. You know, our eyes have evolved so that the whites make the iris and pupil particularly obvious. And what that means is that all the people who came before us who had eyes that were difficult to see either didn't find a mate or were killed. Why do you want to know where someone's pointing their eyes? Because we're very visual creatures. And the center of our vision is extremely expensive in attentive terms. Now, if you look. If you look at your vision while you're looking, you'll see, I'm looking at you. I can see your face. I can't see your face at all. I see a low resolution representation of your head. I can kind of tell that you're human, but I don't, can't tell the sex. Maybe that's my problem. I've heard it is. Um, <laughs> over here, believe it or not, these people are in black and white, although I can't tell that. And out here, there's nothing at all. That's central vision. Every single cell in that central vision is expanded 10,000 times in the primary visual cortex. That's how much horsepower is attached to that central vision. And if your entire visual field was like that, you'd need a head that would be like, you know, well, that's not going to work out. So we move that spot around, and we move it to what we value. 
Why? Well, that's obvious. First of all, if we're going somewhere, we look where we're going. So we don't stumble. And we're going somewhere better, because why would we be going there? Well, unless we're completely confused and want to go somewhere worse, and sometimes that happens, but you get the picture, right? I mean, we specify with our vision those things we value. And that, that's a fundamental discovery of late 20th century psychophysiology. It's, 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 it's a revolutionary discovery that we specify with our perception through a lens of value. And that puts the humanities right back in the middle of the science, by the way. Because the question is, well, why do we value what we value if perception depends on that? We have this notion in some sense, you know, that you can just see the objective world. There it is, objective world. Then you think about it, then you evaluate it, and then you act. That is not how it works. Not at all. And that fact is why part of the reason why we don't have ambulatory robots, why we don't have dishwashing robots. The problem of perception is far more complex than anybody ever realized. And part of the way that's solved is by mapping perception directly onto action, neurophysiologically. And part of that mapping is value. That's worth doing. Right? That's a value judgment. Back to thought. Free speech as a necessary precondition. Okay. You can think of rights as a list, and you can think of them as arbitrary, and you can think of them as something granted by the government or as part of the social contract. Or you can look deeper, and you can say, we have an intuition that people have rights because we have an intuition, which is partly guided by our profound narratives, that certain processes are so vital that you interfere with them at your psychological and social peril. That's why the tyrant puts the hero in chains and why that's wrong. We know that's wrong, but we don't know why. We, do, we can't say why. Well, if Rogers was right and Freud was right, and free speech is the pathway to mental health, then it becomes obvious why it's a right, unless you want everybody to be sick. And if we develop consensus around how we should see things and how we should act by exchanging our views freely, then the consensus is dependent on the process of free speech in exactly the same way that mental health is dependent on it. And then those things are nested inside of one another because, I mean, we could say, and this seems reasonable, that the optimal polity is one that simultaneously consists of people who are the least amount of mentally unhealthy that we can, man that we can manage. Unless we're in favor of unnecessary suffering and misery. A free speech isn't a right among other rights. That's not the right way to look at it. It's the process by which we stop everything from degenerating into hell. It's also your highest ethical obligation. And, and part of that is that listening that I was discussing, right? Because that provides the, the forum for this process to occur. In many ways, that's what a university is. A seminar, a great seminar. Everyone listens to each other, right? And as a consequence of that, and the free exchange of ideas, they're all transformed. They become more articulate. Well, I'm articulated. I have all these joints. I can move them. And to be articulate is a reflection of precisely that. It means that I can embody ideas that are much more suited to my, to my physical nature, that make me much more dynamic and much more adapted, adapted to the uncertainties of the future and capable of contending with them, which is something obviously we all need because the future truly is uncertain. And that's always said against 
the totalitarian proclivity to be right about what you already know. And that, that runs across political lines. It's deeper than that. You know, our perceptions and our actions are constrained by our automatized memories and practices. So we're prisoners of our own expertise, always. And that's great because it makes us fast and efficient, but it's not good because the past isn't the pr present or the future. The past is always dead in some sense, right? And the conservatives say, well, Beware of meddling with traditions, especially if you don't understand them, and fair enough, and don't be thinking you can see the world without traditions, because you can't. And I mean that literally. You look, through a, you look at the world through a prism of value that has been established by the consensus of humankind since the dawn of time. It's part of you. You're a historical creature. There's no escaping it. And so you say, well, tradition, you know, no. It's like, all you do is destabilize yourself. And you might think, well, that's OK. It's not OK. It's unbelievably stressful physiologically. It's terrifying. It's painful. It's devastating for the people around you. And it's destabilizing for society. In no manner is that OK unless that's what you want. And if that's what you want, well, heaven help you, and the rest of us, for that matter. Viewpoint diversity, no. It's not another diversity. That's the wrong way of going about it. It's not part of a list of things that are OK or necessary or desirable. It's the core of consciousness itself. And then you might think, well, consciousness, you know, here we are, pathetic specks on the edge of a desolate, meaningless universe, who cares about consciousness? Well, it's not obvious that there's any reality without consciousness. How about consciousness as a world engendering force? How about that? How about, how about consciousness as something that the cosmos as such would not exist without? Well, what do you think we're hypothesizing about with the imaginative representations of our religious traditions. Why do you think the word is elevated to the highest place in those symbolic routines? Think that's all nothing? It's just old superstition? Yeah, well, you know, our religious beliefs, they suffer often from the same totalitarian proclivity that infects our thinking. Always, it's an existential threat. But that doesn't mean there's nothing there in those stories. There's nothing, that, there's nothing there that we can casually discard and assume nothing catastrophic is going to emerge in the absence of those representations. And you know this, too. You know it at a very deep level. Why? Well, you have a conscience. You misuse your words. See what happens. See what happens. Test it out. Practice to deceive. Well, what happens if you practice? You become what you practice. And I don't mean that metaphysically, although I also mean it metaphysically. I mean that's how you're built. You become what you practice. Practice to deceive. Well, how is that going to work? To be out of concordance with reality. You think of the totalitarian impulse underneath that temptation to deceive. You are so canny that you can bend the fabric of reality to your desire and get away with it. One thing I learned as a clinician, I never saw anyone ever get away with anything, ever. Well, so what do you do as a clinician? Well, you let people talk and you listen to them if you're a wise clinician, because what do you know about what's wrong with them, or what they should do, or who they should be. You don't want to take the presumption of assuming you have answers to that question on board. You don't want to do that with your children. You don't want to do that with your wife. You don't even want to do that with yourself, because what the hell do you know? And so you listen. You listen. And people unfold themselves, and they go just like the pianist who goes back and 
practices where the errors are and gets it right. That's what happens in therapy. It's like you go back and you find the mistakes and you think, well, can that be untangled? That seemed to lead to this. That seemed to lead to this. This mistake caused this. This catastrophe is over here. Is it possible to weave that all together now, to straighten all that out, to clean it up, right? And not to bear the terrible suffering that those errors have caused, to leave that behind. Right? Everyone's fervent hope, right? Wouldn't it be something if we could be free from the shackles of our pasts? Right? Well, it's honesty that does that, but it's a rough route, man. It's through the desert, well before the promised land, even if you're escaping from a tyranny. It's no joke. It's no wonder people don't do it. In the short term, it's, it's really rough, but the alternative is far, far worse. Free speech as a precondition for mental and social health. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you mess with that. We all mess with that. We all fail to take that into account. We all fail to make that sacred at our extreme peril. Let's talk about that for a minute, sacred. So I had this conversation this week with Sam Harris. I think it's the fifth conversation we had. Sam Harris, you may know and you may not, is well known as a, an author and a thinker, and, but more particularly as one of the members of a group of people who were known as the, the four horsemen of the new atheism, essentially, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Daniel Bennett. Um, Harris, is anti-religious in a very profound sense, and this is also the case with Dawkins. And they see the totalitarian spirit in religious traditions and fail to distinguish between the two. And then I can understand that, you know. It's, it's, a, it's an understandable interpretation, but I don't think it's deep enough to solve the problem because the totalitarian instinct is so deep that merely attributing it even to religion is not going to solve it. It's a deeper problem. It's a deeper problem than can be attributed to any given religious tradition, no matter how fundamentalist. Sam has got interested in the sacred. He meditates, and so he uses his meditation as a journey into the landscape outside of language as to revivify. That's part of the meditative tradition. It's part of the tradition of prayer in the West as well. This notion that there is something outside the barren landscape of linguistic certainty upon which our revivification depends. Uh, so that means that an overemphasis on your certainty puts you in a prison that bars you from the well you need to drink from. And that's worth knowing. And that's what the humanities, in part, try to teach students, even though we don't necessarily know it. Sacred. Sacred implies deep. And so we could speak in a non-religious manner here. We could speak technically and as a matter of definition. We all have an intuition of literary depth. And regardless of our religious beliefs or the absence of them, let's say in the case of an atheist, no one seriously disputes the proposition that some stories are deeper than others. And we feel that. You know, you go to a movie that's deep and you're moved. And that's a strange expression. Like, moved where exactly? Well, moved to tears, maybe. Moved to a profound realization. Moved to a transformation in the way you view your life. Moved to a transformation in what you potentially aspire to. All of that, that's movement. It's movement outside of what you knew. And, and it's movement in a direction that's better than what you knew. And wouldn't it all be lovely if we could continue to move in a direction that was always better than what we knew? Is there anything that could possibly be more fervently hoped for than that? So you listen, because maybe someone says something that's a pathway to that. Depth. The deeper, the more sacred. How's that for a definition? What does deep mean? 
you have an argument with your wife about the dishes, and you both get upset, but it's just about the dishes, so it's shallow. You find out she had an affair. That's deep. Why? Because not much depends on who did the dishes. But your entire view of your future depends on the stability of your relationship with your wife and the promise that you both made to each other. And not only that, your interpretation of who you are might depend on that. And worse than that, your interpretation of what happened in the past, which is already hypothetically fixed, depends on that. Because it could be that the revelation of a lie at that depth demolishes your entire past despite the fact that hypothetically it already happened. The deeper something is, the more other things depend on it. What's deepest? Freedom of speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Peterson. We'll, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And um, I think Bella and Josh are going to be on microphones in the aisles here. Uh, they'll come down partway towards the front. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Professor Peterson, uh, please line up behind where they are. And remember, since the time is limited, uh, to try to get to your question as quickly as you can. So thank you. Thank you again. You have a lovely town, by the way. It was really nice to be here. I always like coming to the States. It's such a remarkable place. Dr. Peterson, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And very quickly, I just want to say thank you for uh, the work that you've done over the years in your writing and, and lectures. It's, it's been very helpful for me at times in my life, and I very much appreciate that. The question I'd like to ask is that you very often talk about responsibility and the reaction of your audiences when you talk about responsibility and the benefits to oneself when the life of responsibility is taken upon seriously. My question then is, what ultimately is the telos there? the goal, the aim, the end. Is the telos in me, the one who takes on the responsibility? Is it the one for whom I take responsibility, for whom I help others? Or is the telos something else? It's all of those at the same time, if it's when it's in its perfected form. Right? Because you can think of, we have intimations of paradise, and, and, and that intimation is based at least in part on a notion that peace can be established at multiple levels of organization simultaneously. And it's something that you perceive in music when it's, when it's beautiful, right? Because all of the music has this layered quality, but everything works in accordance with the totality. And so that's why all art aspires to the condition of music, and all speech aspires to the condition of art, let's say. Now, telos, there's no end to its development, but because things could always be better and better, but that's what it's striving for. It's, it's striving for the same thing that's expressed in in the U.S. with the notion that uh, out, of one men, out of many, one, right? E, e pluribus unum. Well, there's a, uni there's a union that's necessary at the highest possible level, which is also part of the drive towards monotheism. And when that responsibility is taken on, it's taken on for your spiritual development and for the stability and health of your family and for the proper placement of your family within the community, the, the narrower community, and then the proper placement of that community within the broader polity, and then all the way up the levels of organization to the highest possible place. And so, and we have a sense of the necessity of that organization and a drive to some degree to attain it. It's, it's part of what gives us vision, let's say, and it's also part of what makes people compelling and charismatic when they emb embody it. Uh, the instinct to, to pursue that is so deep that it, it compels us in imitation. That's worship, by the way, technically speaking. You, know, you imitate what you worship. 
Or, and so you might say you don't worship. It's like, yeah, right. You just don't know what you're worshiping. That doesn't mean you're not doing it. You don't have a choice. You might be a fractured worshiper, and so you worship all sorts of things, 50 different idols. All that means is that you're a mess. And I mean that technically in some sense, because it, unless there's a uniting force, you're not united. Well, what's disunion within? No one finds that, except under very limited conditions of play, when that's toyed with in some sense, everyone finds that terribly aversive, because you're pulled in many directions at once. It's confusing, and, and your body has to hyper-prepare, because what are you going to do? 50 different things. Well, it's unbelievably stressful, technically speaking, it's ex exhausting. That, that unity isn't optional, and that's also why something has to be above. You know, when you look at a cathedral, especially, you see this so much in Orthodox cathedrals, you know, there's a dome, right? Well, that's the sky, obviously, and you often see Christ, Pantocrator, creator of the world, arrayed in the dome, right, looking down. It's a very strange representation. And what carpenter from Galilee simultaneously being some deity that is associated with the sky. It's an unbelievably complicated idea. But part of what it's pointing to is the, what, the ultimate sacredness of a kind of union, a uniting principle. Well, that's the word. That's what that means. The sacred word. And you think, well, you don't believe that. Well, then you're a liar, at least. So this belief, you know, People ask me all the time if I believe in God, and I say, well, what do you mean by believe? And they think, well, that's obvious, and you're just avoiding the question. It's like, it's not obvious. You think it's obvious because you haven't thought about it. It's not obvious at all what it means to believe. So, yeah, so we, we have an instinct for that unity. And, we approach that partly by responsibility. And so you take on responsibility, you know, and it gives your life purpose. Well, why? Well, part of it's this, you know. There's a lot of suffering in the world, and unless you're malevolent, that's not something that you are attempting to make worse, let's say. Well, at minimum, if you're responsible for your family, well, you can shield them from some suffering and like in a productive way, a way that makes them stronger. Well, then, no, no, when you're, when you're alone at night torturing yourself with your stupidity and uselessness, at least you can say to yourself, well, you know, look what I'm doing here. I'm removing some unnecessary hell. Well, what else is going to get you through a dark night? We do our s students, young people, such a disservice by not teaching this, them this about responsibility. It's like you need the meaning. It's not optional in the face of life's suffering. Not unless you want to become bitter, not unless you want to crave death. And if you don't know what that means, that bitterness, that craving for death, it just means you haven't been there. And that's a blessing for you, but it's also a spectacular form of ignorance. Um, I thought it was interesting you, uh, you've been talking about music. I was listening to uh, Jimi Hendrix the other day, and I was thinking, man, if he, had, if he was the world's greatest guitarist, why was he still so unhappy? Maybe he wasn't unhappy, but did people know what he was really talking about when he said, I'm not experienced, or, you know, are you experienced? Not necessarily stoned, but experienced. I realized... Everyone's really experienced. Maybe everyone just wants to be happy, and money's just a coping mechanism because they want to help other people. Do you think Jimi Hendrix was just misunderstood? Well, I imagine he was misunderstood because everyone is. But, you know, that engagement in art of that sort, that's one of the certain antidotes to suffering. It doesn't make it go away, but it might make it bearable. Beauty does that. You know, that's why people go to Europe so often on pilgrimages, even if they don't think that's what they're doing. 
They want to immerse themselves in that spectacular beauty because it's an antidote to suffering. And it's a call to higher things, but a call to higher things is also an antidote to suffering. And a great musician partakes in that insofar as he can. It doesn't mean that he'll be necessarily any more well adjusted psychologically on other fronts than other people who used other means to bolster their existential concerns, let's say. So. Yeah, a musician like that, at least. And so this, I was so, I was obsessed with the meaning of music for a very long time because I realized I made a sculpture of it, which some of you may have seen. It's an image that I use all the time, which is part of, it's an image of this sculpture I made trying to portray the meaning of music because I realized that music was pointing to meaning in a manner that wasn't propositional or subject to rational criticism. It's a transcendent form of meaning, right? I mean, you, you, you go to a concert and someone says, you know, that's just noise, what do you say? You're an idiot, go away, right? Because th that argument has no place in what's happening. And what music demonstrates, and demonstrates to everyone, and it's such a relief, is that that immersement in meaning is actually an experience. Right? It has nothing to do with belief in some sense. It's way deeper than that. And it's absolutely necessary. It's not, you know, some mere byproduct of other cognitive mechanisms, let's say. Psychologists play that game a lot, but they have their reasons for that. I hope that's an answer. Do you think a lot of people know he fought in Vietnam? I have no idea. Do you think a lot of people just think he was talking about being stoned? Again. It's outside my domain of competence to speculate on such things. Another question? Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson, for giving the talk. I drove four hours today to come see you, so it's really great to be able to ask you a question personally. Um, my question has to do uh, with the topic tonight. I've been trying to formulate it for a while now, and it, it's basically um, under what circumstances, if any, would self-preservation be taken more important than standing for your beliefs, as in the form of free speech? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's one of those questions you have to take part again before you can answer them. It depends on what you mean by self. It depends on what you mean by preservation. And, and, and I'm not trying to to take your question lightly, you know, what you see happening very often is that people take the easy way out in the moment and sacrifice future possibilities, often that they don't even understand. And I see this, well, I see this continually, especially when I was dealing with people who were trying to straighten out their family psychologically. There's issues that they just wouldn't discuss, and no wonder, because it was going to be hell to discuss them, but not nearly as much hell as not discussing them. And that's the issue, and that's, that's the conundrum. I don't think I can specify the circumstances. I would say there, it's not, you, you can't encapsulate that within a series of propositions in some sense. I would say more, you have to orient yourself so that you're able to answer those questions for yourself. And how do you do that? Well, one way of doing that is, well, to listen. That's definitely one way. The other is not to say things you believe to be false. Why would you do that? Well, because you, you, you build de defects into your character by practicing deception. Well, then when a problem like that comes around, which is a big problem, you're not going to be able to answer it. And God only knows what that's going to cost you. Like it might cost you your conscience. It might cost you your family. It might cost you your, your country. So you have to build yourself into the person that can answer such questions for himself. You know, wh why not lie if you can get away with it? Well, first of all, that's a big if. And the second is, well, because you build yourself into a liar. And then in a moment of crisis, you won't be able to trust your judgment. And then you'll be lost. And that's a, that's a vision of hell if you take it seriously. And I'm dead serious about that. So, yeah.
It's an honor, sir. Um, you've dramatically helped my life in a number of ways. I've had this question I wanted to ask you for some time. I've seen you mention multiple times how the positive impact and help you have been able to give others has been a rewarding aspect of your life, even an antidote or justification for suffering. What advice would you give to those who wish to positively impact others through the avenue you do, which is to find and then speak truth? What advice would you give to someone who wants to speak truth to the world like you do? And then a second one on topic, how do we stand against the current tyranny against free speech? Well, you stand against that tyranny in your own life first because your, your proclivity to lie is part of the totalitarian impulse. It's the same thing. And so if you don't fight that in your soul first, you won't be able to fight it successfully anywhere else. You know, that's why Solzhenitsyn said that the line between good and evil runs down the, runs down the heart of every individual. He meant that in relationship to totalitarian certainty. It's fundamentally a psychological issue as far as I'm concerned. And that's partly because the individual in a very fundamental way is sovereign. And the voice of the individual is the savior of the state. Practically speaking, well, first, you know, you, you want to decide that maybe you're not going to lie anymore. You know, you've got to think that through. It's got to be a, a vow, let's say, or an aim. And then I think you can, you can think it through. I watch this a lot in, in therapy. One of the things I really learned being a therapist, and I spent most of my time listening, believe it or not, even though I talk incessantly, I did learn to listen as a therapist. I could tell when I wasn't listening enough because the person got boring. And so I knew that if the session, my mind started to wander in the session, instead of me being sort of riveted on what the person was saying, that I wasn't listening hard enough, and so I'd, you know, I got distracted by something. And, but if I listened harder, then they'd get more interesting. And, the, the degree to which they were interesting was precisely proportionate to the degree to which they were telling the truth. And the deeper the truth they were telling, the more interesting they were. And so that was a fascinating thing to, to, to observe. And it was fascinating as well to see how interesting people were, regardless of who they were, if you really listen to them. Because people are very strange creatures. And, I mean, they're, they're so strange they're, that their strangeness is terrifying to themselves. You know, once they step outside the domain of polite conventionality, let's say, or the, or the prison of totalitarian certainty, they step outside of that into the realm of reality, they're unbearably interesting. It's like continual Dostoevsky novels. And if you don't experience the people are boring, no, no, it's you. It's not people. Believe me, if it's people or you, it's you. Yeah, that's for sure. So, one of the things that I discussed with my clients, and this is, came partly from Rogerian practice, was this idea of something like an emotional congruity. At, at times you can feel that your words are in alignment with you. You know, and, and part of that is that shame you feel when you know you're wandering from the truth for some underhanded reason of your own. You feel that. You can feel that. And, you know, you fight the feeling and you deny it, and so then you diminish your expertise at perceiving it, and then, of course, that makes it easier for you to lie, and it's like downhill from there. But you can practice that, and you can feel your words. You can see if they're solid. You can see if you believe them, you know, while you're saying them. Is this, if I got the word right? You know, when I was teaching my students to write, it's like, is the word right? Is it the right word? Is it the right phrase? Is it solid? Why should I care? I'll write what the professor wants. Of all the sins that universities commit, the enticing of students to parrot what the professor wants is the worst to teach those students to corrupt their word. And so, you students out there, you say, you students, you say, oh, well, I have to write what the professor wants. And you think you won't think that afterwards. Well, you will. You think you can write down what you don't believe and you won't believe it. That doesn't happen. You write down something you don't believe, you're way closer to believing it. 
You think you're immune from your own arguments? You think that delineating and articulating a complex argument that runs contrary to what you truly believe in your soul won't tilt you in that direction? It's like, who do you think you are? That isn't how things work. And it's highly unlikely that you've thought out anything in your life as deeply as you're thinking out what you're writing to please that professor. And it's not the professor you're pleasing, it's whatever demon they're possessed by. So you, you start to listen to what you say and see you haltingly have I got it right? Like your, not like your life depends on it, like your soul depends on it. Because it does. Thank you, sir. Fear of God, the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, uh, for being here. I'm a huge fan. I've seen you on YouTube a lot. I spent hours watching you. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm thankful that you came here. My question to you is you're very familiar with the Bible, I'm sure. I've seen a lot. Um, familiar with? The Bible. Are you, are you somewhat familiar with the Bible? I'm somewhat familiar. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, my question to you is what would be like your favorite passage in the Bible, and how has that helped you in your career, in your life, in your, in your personal life, and how has that helped you to, to motivate you to continue what you do? Because obviously you need a lot of bravery, um, and the Bible has a ton of bravery. I think of like the, uh, ju the, the judges in the Old Testament who helped Israel to get through those dark times. I think of Jesus, um, and even Paul in some sense, who faced the tyrannical Roman government from stamping out Christianity. Um, do you understand my question? What is truth? Well, I'm a believer. I would say Jesus is That's the truth. That's the phrase. That's Pontius Pilate's question to Christ. What is truth? Yeah, that's my favorite line. Do you have a follow-up question? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask it for him. Why? Why is that your favorite passage? Because I realized when I was young that I didn't know the answer to that question. So I spent my whole life trying to figure it out, what that meant, why it wasn't the right question, or maybe it was the right question, and what it meant in that context. You know, when I first talked to Sam Harris, all we did for two hours was argue about the definition of truth. You know, and it was it was necessary. It wasn't the most elegant conversation, I wouldn't say. And I was trying to prove something harder than I should have been instead of listening and asking questions, which is what I should have done. But it's a fundamental question. So, Dr. The Peterson. truth is what sets you free. And that's what the truth is. I want to let you know that I have a lot more respect for you than I did when I walked in here after seeing the level of honesty and vulnerability that you displayed in your speech. Seven months ago in an interview with Jan Jonathan Pagayu, he broke down into tears and stated that you believe the story of Christ is real, that it is undeniable, and that he is the ultimate example of the union between the physical and spiritual worlds. So my question to you is when can we expect your conversion to the faith, or will you continue to talk about what you know to be the truth and speak of biblical knowledge, knowledge of what is sacred, knowledge of the truth, under the tarp of your evolutionary humanism? That's not a question. That's a trap. And my answer to that is, I did the best I could in that interview. And I mean that literally. That was the best I could do. There isn't anything past that. Not yet. It's as far as I've gotten. It's as much as I can say. And when our people ask me what I believe, I say, what do you mean by believe? So I ask you that. Thank you. No problem. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson, for being here. Uh, thank you for making this the first school you've chosen in two and a half uh, years. Uh, I'm honored, certainly. Um, I've written my question down so I could formulate it better. I've had many people come to me asking for advice. Uh, I'll post online about you know me being here for anyone should they need someone to vent to or someone to just talk to. Um, and even sometimes I won't know what to do or say and I will feel bad for it. And many people I've talked to have ruled therapy out and um, I understand this may be a case by case basis, but is there anything you can recommend I do or say to help in more of a general sense? Or is it just listen as uh, you... There's no just listening. The better you are at listening, the better that will work. Like, listening is absolutely transformative. And so, you know, you're practicing it and people are coming to you at least to some degree because you're capable at least to some degree of listening. And so if you listen, you will find the way. So, and then it is a case by case basis at that point, but that's okay because if you listen, you'll find out the case by case way. So, and you also, you know, you want to be, be satisfied with what you're capable of doing. You know, it's, it's, it's easy if you're compassionate and, and you're, you have a proclivity to help and you're a good listener to begin with. It's very easy to take on too much. And some of that can be an arrogance in that. You don't want to steal the person's destiny. You don't want to steal their victories. And, and you don't want to suffer unduly for their defeats because how much can you take after all, right? And so it takes a lot of practice. You have to be cautious. And, but it's hard to be really trying to listen. Amazing what you learn if you listen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Peterson, you champion free speech, denounce identity politics, and are being hosted tonight by the Open Discourse Coalition. My question is, should we platform those who not only hate our values and ideas, but would not hesitate to destroy everything we hold dear. And possibly furthermore, uh, maybe a simpler take, how would you uh, engage in a fruitful discussion with someone who disagrees on basic moral issues such as uh, the nuclear family, the existence of the nuclear family? Okay, well, there's a lot in that question. I mean, that's the thing about questions is that they contain the desired answer so often. Well, you shouldn't platform someone who desires the destruction of everything you hold sacred. I mean, that'd be like inviting Satan himself onto the stage, you know, but probably that isn't who you're considering platforming or not. So, you know, I would point to an error in the formulation of the first part of that question, because it had the presumptions in it that compelled a particular kind of answer. And so that's a technical issue about questions. The second part, I'm sorry, you have to tell me the second part again. How would you go about engaging in a fruitful uh, discussion with someone who disagrees on basic uh, moral issues? Well, they're pretty interesting if they disagree. It's like, you don't think that, why not? Well, that's, a, that's the opening to a great conversation, assuming that neither party's lying. You know, I mean, you talk to someone who agrees with you, it's, well, then you get a pat on the back because what you know is right as far as it's reflected in them, but you don't learn anything. And maybe you don't need to learn everything because you're already in paradise, you know, so good for you. But otherwise, listen, ask questions too. That's the most effective, even as an, let's say as a, what? As a discursive strategy, there's nothing better than asking questions. You know, and, and especially if it's motivated by genuine interest. It's like, well, why do you think, why do you believe that? Oh, and there's a bunch of questions in that. Do you actually believe that? Is that someone, something that just someone, is that just something that someone told you? Are you believing that for reasons that you're not revealing? Are other beliefs that you cherish for reasons we don't know dependent on that belief? Um, are you parroting something that someone you admire said and you haven't thought through. All of that's part of the landscape of questioning if you're talking to someone who actually has a different opinion than you. And you need a certain detachment as well. So part of it is apprehension of your own ignorance. They might know something, even if 95% of what they know isn't, or what they say isn't acceptable to you, 5% might be gold. That's not none. If you can get that gold, 
Well, that's what you do when you read a novel or any work critically. No to the chaff, yes to the wheat. Well, that's what you do in a discussion. You know, it's, it's much better than to, it's much better if you can manage that than to attempt to win. Now, I know there's place for debate, you know, and victory, but generally speaking, that's a lower level of discourse than questioning. And you can get so far with questions. You point out logical, in, in, what, logical contradictions. You said this 15 minutes ago, but now you say this, and as far as I can see, those aren't commensurate. Am I misunderstanding, or, or how do you reconcile the difference? I did that as a clinical practitioner quite constantly when I was listening. It's like, well, you said this 10 minutes ago, and now you're saying this, and they seem opposite. It wasn't a, it wasn't a rejecting judgment, although it was a judgment. How do you reconcile that? Well, if, if it was, in fact, contradictory, it meant they were trying to act out or perceive two incommensurate, uh, two... Uh, at least two things that were incommensurate. You can't do that. So that's, a, that's definitely a place for psychological distress. And so becoming a good questioner, that's, that's really effective. So I, I think um, it, it may be that all good things come to an end, but we actually have a book signing uh, period that's coming up now, and so we, I think we probably need to cut the questions off. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all. Thank you very much.